This is not a video about new SpongeBob being bad. This is not a video about older SpongeBob being good. This is just a video about SpongeBob, a cartoon character who cannot see, hear, or feel real emotions. I remember being about 15 or so when I logged onto Twitter one day and was presented with this clip from one of the newest episodes of Spongebob Squarepants. This, sir, is Pinosterous! I demand restitution! I hadn't watched this show since I was a kid. My only method of consuming the series in my teen years was through Mr. Enterrance about how bad the newer seasons were. So when I saw this, my mind was blown. This looks spectacular! When did Spongebob's animation get so good? Now, in 2023. When someone posts a clip from a recent Spongebob episode, the replies are bombarded with folks ripping apart its visuals, saying that the animation is way too distracting, that it takes away from the comedy as the wacky thesis have become a crutch for its poor writing, and that the old season's method was better, in which the characters would be expressive, sure, but they seldom used those money shots, the moments where a character would go way off model to elevate a certain joke and surprise you. And with that, it seemed that every time a new episode released, we'd have to go through this same song and dance again and again. Spongebob fans share clips, general audiences tear it to shreds because it's the first time they're seeing the show in years, which is met with said Spongebob fans trying to reiterate time and time again that the animation of Spongebob isn't the problem. You are. That the show is the exact same as it's always been, and the only reason it doesn't appeal to you anymore is because you're not in its target demographic, and so of course you wouldn't enjoy it. And just to nip this in the bud, because for some reason I've become the unofficial spokesperson for the new Spongebob has bad animation cried. Even in my videos most negative towards the guy, I don't think I I've ever said the animation was bad. One thing I would like to compliment the show on is the animation. Spongebob is consistently one of the most impressive ones I've seen, with how expressive it can be. And the backgrounds in this series are stellar, I really love the colors. I can't speak for everyone, but my views have never been about whether or not this animation style is good. It's always been about whether or not it fits Spongebob and what the series was aiming to do in its beginning. But I guess that's the issue with voicing your opinion on the internet. The game of telephone goes further and further to the point where expressing how you think sometimes the gags can go a bit overboard turns into you thinking that the animation itself is bad and that you don't care about the medium, when that was never my argument. If you go back and watch my ranking video, in retrospect, I feel like I praise the animation more often than not. My issues instead came from the feeling that the animation was being prioritized over the writing. That the wacky faces and expressions were simply substitutes for the snappy, clever dialogue of its early years. An opinion I held after trying out some episodes of the modern era, and noticing how gag-driven the series appeared to be. I always remembered Spongebob for its witty dialogue and occasional out-there moment that would catch you off guard and stick in your mind for years. Whereas the newer ones I'd watch all seemed to be doing the same repetitive jokes over and over again. The humor deriving from a character just repeating the same thing endlessly with the joke being, they said the thing that they always say. Everything is so amazing! 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 <laughs> amazing! And because of that, it made me put all of that blame on the animation. That they'd rather show you a funny face than tell an actual joke. But that's not fair. For one, I can't get mad at folks for not getting five hours into a video like that to hear what I think of the animation. It's much more accessible to watch a 45 second short where I try to sum up these thoughts within a single statement. But also... It's not constructive to imply that these things have any relation with each other. That the staff would intentionally try to focus more on the animation than good writing. I've also said before that sometimes it feels as if the artists are trying too hard to come up with the next big Spongebob meme instead of reeling it back and knowing when to hit the audience with those exaggerated faces when, again, that's not really fair on the artists. It's impossible to assume the thought process behind this shift, but to imply it's for any other reason then. They wanted to draw a funny face is a pretty cynical mindset to have, and for that I apologize, truly. See, every time I see this discussion, I feel like chiming in with my own two cents, but find it incredibly difficult to articulate my actual thoughts in a quick and easy to understand manner. Like I'm walking on eggshells. Because I'm no animator. I've never worked in the industry. And so for me to assume the intentions behind certain decisions is obviously going to be biased in some way towards my thoughts on current Spongebob. But what knowledge I do have is... What I think of this. I may not have the perspective of being a fly on the wall to have overseen how the series got to this point, but I do have the perspective of a longtime SpongeBob fan. Someone who watched the first seven or eight seasons as they aired and then came back years later to see what they had missed. So if you don't want to hear that, then that's okay. No, really, it's fine. You can leave. You don't need to listen to me. It's not like I have any authority in the matter. SpongeBob ain't going anywhere.
Or you could stick around. Listen to what I have to say as an uneducated average Joe talking about a series that played an important part in my childhood. And if you disagree, great. Leave a comment. Let's have a discussion. Even if just to say, fuck you, you have no idea what you're talking about, you clown. No, no, really, it's fine, honestly. So with all that, let's get into it. What I think is SpongeBob's animation evolution over the years, the pros and cons of each era, and to check out some of the brand new episodes that have come out since I last kept up with the series. People have been telling me they've started to strike a better balance between well-written stories and off-the-walls animation, so I'm curious to see if I'll come out of this having a newfound appreciation for the recent episodes. Who knows? Knows. What I do know is... Bubblegum friggin' rocks! This video is sponsored by Bubblegum Kids. No really, it's like a kid's fantasy come to life. Bubblegum Kids is a brand new company aiming to bring back that childhood nostalgia. I have not had a piece of bubblegum since I sold them on my high school bus like 10 years ago, but immediately upon trying it, this brought me back to a time where I just grab one of those big long strips of it and take a bite out of the center. You get a hell of a deal too. They sell them in either containers of one or a multi-pack containing six, each with 55 pieces of gum in them. That means you'd have a piece of gum for almost every day of the year, as well as sugar-free and vegan for all you health nuts. Even if just getting them for your kids, it's a much healthier alternative to the gum you find in stores. With all that and a fun little collecting aspect with each pack having a different one of their titular bubblegum kids, be sure to click the link in the description and check out what they have to offer, as they provide free shipping across the US and a little sticker sheet to whoever uses my link. Also, if you use code LSMARKETCHECKOUT, you get 20% off. And thanks to Bubblegum Kids for sponsoring this video. I was inspired to write this by a certain Toon community F slur by the name of L.S. Mark. Recently he whined about Spongebob actually being a real cartoon now, while all, all while defending Bean Mouth bullshit with his life like a typical Toon community hack. Uh, they try and claim animation is cinema, but use crap like the Mario movie and other kids movies to make that point. Where do I stand? Originally, I was gonna spend some time focusing on this weird-as-fuck animation purist thing I've seen popping up more, where people become infuriated at someone for liking newer media without having enough appreciation for the classics. I said that when talking about a show, I like to do more than just focus on the animation, and that there's other aspects I care to discuss more, and these people cried a fucking river like I just shot their dog. You criticized this Spongebob episode but couldn't tell this moment was a direct homage to the 1948 classic Porky Pig and Baba Booey World? Typical fake animation fan. Like, dude, I just watched the dang cartoon and said what I thought about it. It's not that deep, bro. Make your own video about why Adult Party Cartoon is actually an underrated hidden gem, because I sure as hell ain't gonna make it. But I'm gonna tune all of that out and just focus on the Bob. When SpongeBob first began its run back in 1999, they had adopted a method of storytelling that its creator, Steven Hillenburg, had quite the fondness for. That being, it was storyboard driven. With a small group of artists getting together and boarding an entire episode based off just a short outline containing the premise. The major beats were all let out and they knew where they wanted the characters to start and end, but how they got there was completely up to the artists, which I believe truly allowed them to let loose and undoubtedly is the main contributing factor for many of the show's most iconic moments. I read a lot of testimonies from staff who had worked on the series in these early days who attribute this to its high quality. The fact that they were able to create these really funny pieces for episodes and then punch up the story and dialogue later on. There's a time and a place for a script-driven show, there's a time and a place for a, uh, an artist-driven show, and I think Spongebob works best because it's a cartoonist-driven show. And we got to do a lot of cartoon gags, you know, exploited animation as much as possible. Now the opposite to this would have been a script-driven series, where a writer or a group of writers sit down and create a script for an entire episode which is then handed off to artists to storyboard art for the animators. The advantages to this are obviously that when writing out an entire script you're able to focus on the stories and the characters more cohesively, while the artists can then focus on... well, the art. Letting them go crazy and do whatever they want within the confines of what the script calls for. You know, they don't have to worry about also writing and making sure the story is still progressing as all of that has already been let out. I think it's interesting to talk about as, funnily enough, both of these eras, pre-movie Spongebob and post-sequel Spongebob, use the opposite method you would initially expect them to. Early Spongebob, you know, the one with more stiff animation and more focused on dialogue, was board-driven. It starts with the artists, or as more recent Spongebob, basically everything after the second movie, switched to being script-driven. Ironically, Spongebob's animation at its most expressive starts with a writer. But the more you think about it, the more it makes sense. Without having to worry about writing the story and figuring out where the characters are going to end up, the artists have a pre-existing piece to work off, allowing them to put all their attention on pushing the characters to their extreme, posing and expression-wise. Something worth noting is that the series creator, Steven Hillenburg, wasn't much of an animator in his early days, instead famously starting out as a mere marine biologist. 
<laughs> yeah, dude, why not do something that'll actually help the world, like drawing funny cartoon characters? And so that's just what he did. Going to the California Art Institute, also known as the Dreaded Cal Arts, where he befriended Joe Murray, who would later enlist Hillenburg's help, making him a director on his new show for Nickelodeon, Rocco's Modern Life. Rocco is also a board-driven show, meaning it's what Steven would end up having the most experience with. So it makes sense that when given the chance to make his own series for Nickelodeon, he would adopt that same method. Along with his general love for old Looney Tunes and the like. I think this is why if you look at Season 1 of Spongebob, the closest thing I'd compare it to would be Rocco. Where the characters' expressions are perched and emphasized, but the animation itself remains rather simple aside from a few select scenes. With how hard it was producing quality animation on cells with a TV budget in the 90s, it made sense that when you're not able to afford to do a whole lot with your animation, that you try your best to ensure that the show at least looked consistently good, with characters more often than not standing around in their base model sheet layout cycling through select mods, which allowed them to allocate that extra time and budget they saved on scenes that were more visually interesting. Really, in its early years, there wasn't that much special about Spongebob's animation. It wasn't bad by any means, but it sure wasn't pushing any boundaries. If you want that, then just check out Ren and Stimpy, where the artists were encouraged against using model sheets, so that each pose, each face, every single drawing could look entirely different different, doing just about everything in house, whereas other shows were outsourcing their animation to different countries so they could cut costs, sacrificing quality in the process. But as a result of its much more ambitious animation and incredibly high standards from its creator John Crick Felucci, Ren and Stimpy became an infamously hard show to produce and work on, with everyone and their mother knowing about John K's eventual firing from Nickelodeon. There is merit to the idea that the end justifies the means, that if it weren't for all the dozens and dozens of scrap drawings that never saw the light of day because they just weren't up to snuff, that we wouldn't have a show that blew people away like those early Ren and Stimpy's did. But with that series crash and burn, I think it became apparent to everyone that that kind of ambition wasn't feasible with how animated series were produced at the time. And that's why I believe that pre-movie Spongebob found this perfect middle ground between the two. It knew when to show off its visual chops, and because of that, those moments stand out more in comparison to the rest of an episode where characters just stand around talking. Even adopting a couple techniques uh, not started by, but at least popularized by the Ren and Stimpy crew, such as having these static shots of the character but beautifully hand-painted in a way to emphasize something, whether it be an object or a fetus. The thought process being that if they're not going to animate it, you're at least looking at something that's so well done that you'll want to look at it for a prolonged period of time. Funnily enough, quite a few artists who worked on Ren and Stimpy back in the day eventually wind up working on Spongebob, a couple notable ones even remaining on the series to this day, such as Vincent Waller. So there's no denying that some of that influence has wiggled its way into uh, the sponge. Although, I find that quite ironic, as post-sequel Spongebob shifted to a method of producing a cartoon that John Ken notoriously hated, believing that the only way to truly make a cartoon was through artists, not writers, taking shots whenever he could. I hear these cartoon shows have 25 writers each! Harvard graduate! Probably I'll make five grand a week to come up with this preposterous stuff. I have no idea what the reasoning was for the switch to scripts in Spongebob's keys, although based on a couple tweets from artists who currently or previously worked at Nick, it seems to suggest that overall having a board-driven show is just too much work to put on the artists, with the pay not reflecting the fact that not only are they storyboarding the entire show, but also writing it. I think it also just highlights how different the industry is these days, especially after COVID. With so many jobs being freelance and done remotely, it probably wouldn't be wise to rely on people who potentially aren't even in the same room together to write all the dialogue for an episode. It must be cheaper and overall simpler to provide them with an already completed script. Again, that's just if I'd have to guess though, who knows. I focused a lot on how Hillenburg really wanted to do a show that was board-driven, but that's not to say he would have hated how it was handled these days. Quite the contrary, actually. With the release of the second film, he actually made a return to the series after stepping down from the first one. And while I don't believe he was attributed with writing or directing any episode, he definitely oversaw production at the very least and gave his approval towards the direction they were taking the show in. It has come to my attention that we are like 15 minutes into this video and I've yet to actually talk about any episode. My bad. So one argument I've seen pop up more frequently over the past few months is that while sure behind the scenes there have been plenty of switch-ups and how episodes are made, but the core of the show still feels the same. That the humor, writing, and characterization isn't all that different from the first couple of seasons. And I'm sorry, I personally have to disagree because from what I've watched, their approach to storytelling comes off vastly different in comparison. Something I immediately noticed when working on my big ranking video where I watched every episode in order was how gag-driven the series was starting to veer towards. Whereas early on, I would argue it was driven by the characters. Their emotions and their conflicts pushed the plot instead of jokes or set pieces. 
Now, obviously, this isn't going to apply to every single episode. You're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place where if you don't give examples, then you're not basing your argument on anything. And if you do give examples, it's seen as cherry picking. So I'll try my best to explain what I mean. And I think the best way to go about that would just be to take you through a couple episodes from the pre-movie and post-sequel Spongebobs. And again, just because I'm saying they're different doesn't mean I'm calling one definitively bad and one definitively good. This is more so for the purpose of highlighting the slight changes in how stories are approached and how, to me at least, it changes the whole vibe of the series. Comparing two random episodes would be a tad unfair, so to make it a little more even, I'm gonna use the first episode of the series, you know, the pilot, and compare it to the first episode of the season where I started noticing the shift, season 9, with Help Wanted versus Extreme Spots. Being, well, a pilot, Help Wanted has to make some sort of effort to establish these characters to us, so we begin by seeing SpongeBob's morning routine, him getting ready for the day before bursting out the door and approaching the Krusty Krab where he wants to get their fry cook position. After initially feeling like not going through with it, his best friend Patrick encourages him to go ahead and apply, giving a little bit of exposition as to how badly he wants the job and how qualified he is for it. Before he enters, the cashier Squidward notices him and warns the owner Mr. Krabs about SpongeBob, and so trying to get rid of him, they say he can only get the position if he goes out in a wild goose chase and buys this spatula that doesn't even exist. As he heads out, a massive horde of anchovies come in and wreak havoc on the restaurant. And just when everything seems lost, Spongebob bursts back in, somehow having found the exact spatula Mr. Krabs told him to get, and proves himself as being more than capable by beating the lunch rush and earning Mr. Krabs a shit ton of money in the process, ending with him getting the job. It's simple, but it's one of the best pilots to any cartoon for a reason. It perfectly sets up the characters while showing you an average day in their lives. There's a clear through line. Spongebob wants the job, faces adversity, proves himself, gets the reward. Each scene here is driven by the characters and them trying to achieve their respective goals. In comparison, let's quickly go over the plot for Extreme Spots. We begin with Spongebob and Patrick on the beach building sandcastles, before being alerted to a group of extreme sport... Turs? Extreme sportists? Sporties? Johnny Knoxville, him and his group being super action-packed and doing all these cool epic stunts. Amused by this, Spongebob and Patrick want to join his crew. And after a bit of standing around and making jokes about them misinterpreting a British guy saying extreme sports, thinking he's really saying extreme spots, they get pushed into doing some stunts like riding a motorcycle and falling off a cliff. The crew, who have just accepted letting them be a part of their gang without really saying it, want to know what games they like to play. And so Sponge and Pat play jump rope. Then the Drasticals do it, but extreme. Then they blow bubbles, which is followed by the Drasticals doing it, but extreme. Spongebob then gets in a ring and loses a fight to a pillow. So Johnny comes in and beats it up. Then Patrick jumps in a dumpster, which is followed by the Drasticals doing it. But extreme. Spongebob and Patrick take them jellyfishing, which is ironically the most extreme sport of all, with the Drasticals all getting violently injured. But they're happy about it. British guy comes in and makes the same joke again. And that's the end. Obviously, this is one episode out of the dozens and dozens that have undoubtedly done more story-wise, but you see what I mean, right? Nothing feels influenced by the characters. Instead of each scene being driven by them and what they want, it's instead driven by what gags they can do. What silly scenarios we can think up for the characters to be in. And there's nothing wrong with that. I just can't help but prefer it the way it was done before. Like, I don't know, what if we started at Jellyfish Fields instead of the beach? SpongeBob and Patrick are going about their business when the Drasticals come in and shred up the place. There's so many hills and formations there, what if they were using it as like a little makeshift skate park? SpongeBob and Patrick get intimidated by them and try to get them to leave as they're disrupting the peace and then the Drasticals make fun of them or something? Then they have to prove who's more extreme, loser has to leave. Ending with the Drasticals getting attacked by jellyfish like in the final. Not a 10 out of 10 episode or anything, but there's something. But, at the same time, I get why they feel as if that's not necessary. We're at season 9 and like a million episodes in. At this point in time, everybody and their dog knows Spongebob. Less needs to be done with the characters because you know how they act. It doesn't matter that the jellyfishing comes out of nowhere at the end because this is Spongebob. You already know he likes jellyfishing. And that's fine, I can't stress that enough. But for me personally, I've always been a fan of the approach that acts like each episode takes place within a vacuum. Even if there is continuity, an effort is made to cater towards someone who may have never seen an episode before. I only bring this example up because I was literally watching it last night so it's fresh on my mind. 
There's probably a better one, who cares, but... Lately, I've been watching through Futurama for the first time, which has been great so far. But that show does so much in regards to making things clear to a new viewer. In the pilot to that show, we see our main character, Fry, in the present day where he briefly gets dumped by his girlfriend. It's quick and just meant to establish that he's got a crappy life there. But way later in Season 2, they have an episode where he finds her being released from the same cryogenics lab he came to the future in. Where they then have a plot about them reuniting, it's not really relevant. It would have been easy for this to be the first time we see her. Just assume that the viewer knows who this is if they've seen the pilot, and if not, the context of an ex-girlfriend is all they really need. But even then, during the beginning of the episode, they still make an effort to establish that to a new audience. It's not necessary by any means, and the episode would have been fine without it, but it shows an intention to tell a complete three-act story, with elements introduced in the beginning that pay off later. It's easy but effective in making an episode feel like a completed narrative. Nothing comes off like it's coming out of left field. Spongebob, of course, is not going to be able to do that as heavily since its average episode is about half the length of Futurama's. But something, anything, no matter how small, goes a long way. And that's not to say that no episode before the first movie was similar to Season 9's approach. You know, you have episodes like No Weenies Allowed, which primarily features Spongebob in one location going back and forth with the gags getting more and more extreme as it goes on. But even then, Spongebob has a reason for wanting to get in other than... Well, he wants to. His friend is going in there and he wants to join becoming offended when he's not seen as being tough enough, which is established as something he cares about, as the entire opening to the episode is a prolonged scene of him and Sandy fighting. I feel like if this episode were approached now, the mindset would be, well, we already know Spongebob likes karate at this point, we don't need to showcase that. Even the episodes between the two movies, which typically are seen as the dark age for the franchise, I'd argue are more in line with pre-movie Spongebob than the post-sequel seasons are. Boy, I hope you're keeping up with this terminology, it is a nightmare. But that's not where the main source of contention here comes from. It comes from... The Wacky Feces. <laughs> It's no secret that I've been quite public with my thoughts on current Spongebob's animation style. And while I often see my points exaggerated and pushed to extremes that I never once claimed, you know, it went there for a reason. I did express that I wasn't a fan, but I think the writing plays such an important role in why I think that. Again, the animation on a technical level looks great. A little weightless, I think when every character can squash and stretch to their heart's content it lessens the impact of their frequent slapstick. But I think it only bothered me so much because I felt it was being prioritized over the writing, which I of course now understand that not to be the case. But even then, some might say good. The animation should be prioritized because it's a cartoon. But I think that fails to acknowledge where the series got its beginning, and why those first few seasons were so successful. And I think the dialogue and jokes played into that more than the animation did. Post-sequel Spongebob feels like one big apology for those middle seasons between the first and second movie. The visuals at that point had a major focus on gross art. Super detailed shots of a character contorting our giant veiny monsters, or all the times we'd see a character's blood and guts and skeletons exposed. It didn't work because despite all of this, it looked so bland. It's very strange because if you take a look at a lot of the art in the production stage, mainly by Robert Ryan Corey, you'll see these same drawings when they looked great. These are some phenomenal, really cool and unique depictions of the characters. May not be your ideal Spongebob, but you can't deny the talent here. But then, you take a look at these same drawings in the finished episodes, and something just feels off about them. There's a charm to hand-drawn sketches and animation that sadly gets lost in translation when done over digitally. I think maybe it has to do with the line art. It's trying too hard to be on-model with sketches that purposefully go out of their way to be off-model. There's also no real variation to the line width compared to the sketches. I don't say this often, but I think if anything, the line art is too thick, not allowing you to see those subtle nuances that come with thinner, sketchy art. In comparison, it feels like now they're making an effort to allow the artists to have fun with it, sprinkle in their own touch of Spongebob and friends. It's very much one of those shows where if you're even a casual fan, gonna pick up on certain artists and their quirks. Such as Aaron Springer, who had been working on episodes up until season 8. If you look at some of his original boards, they were fucking massacred into this lame-as-hell, super-sanitized, on-model version of the characters. Which the middle seasons were infamous for not straying too much from. For a while, Spongebob was either disgusting or soulless, no in-between. And so it feels like, now at least, they've started to embrace that aspect. Every artist's unique vision of the characters. Which has resulted in the Spongebob we see now. I can only ever see artists being allied to art as a good thing, but I think in some regards, the emphasis put on this more exaggerated style of animation has affected the show's humor in some ways. And while some may like this change, it just isn't what I go to Spongebob for. Spongebob always had a formula in its style of telling jokes, but I imagine it was approached similar to a three-panel comic strip. 
You got the setup, the build-up, and then the punchline. Not every page was like this, but I'm sure at least on a psychological level, working that way will bring that audio. It's such a natural format for telling jokes. Because it was all done on paper too, you had to restrict yourself when it came to how varied the character's movements could be. If you wanted a character to change their expressions midway through a sentence, you had to draw something entirely new. And with budgets and deadlines to consider, it's most likely why when the characters are talking, they're more often than not holding the same face and position until they're done. In comparison to now, where storyboarding has never been easier. Want to draw a new expression? Just click a button and you have a blank canvas. Copy and paste whatever doesn't need to be redone, and there you go. The characters can shift, bend, and exaggerate as much as you're willing to draw. There were methods like this for drawing on paper. I noticed whenever they want to reuse a position but with minor changes, they'll more often not just draw the silhouette with the added detail so the animator knows what needs changed. But there's no denying with how accessible these art programs are nowadays that storyboarding something expressive and varied has never been so simple. I'm sure the amount of boards it takes to complete an episode now are monumental compared to what it was done traditionally. And I think that's the main reason why we get these clips shared around online where characters change to a different face every other word. I'm sure if we had that technology when the show first started, we'd be seeing something similar. Similar. And it's not even really that severe. There's a few select moments where it definitely goes too far in my opinion, but these moments aren't as frequent as people say they are. I guess I'm included in that, aren't I? My bad. These characters have been around for so long now that people have had literal decades to learn how to draw them and add their own spin. And we've seen the show slowly adapt certain changes over time. One I see folks complaining about online a lot is Spongebob's design differences. You know you've seen one of those amazing DeviantArt drawings where it's old Spongebob beating up new Spongebob, they're great. Now, some people may look at these two images and go, what design change? He virtually looks the exact same. But, <laughs> being a Sonic fan, I'm used to arguments about minor design differences and how they can drastically affect how your character comes off. And I think these differences in his design, again, highlight the different approach to writing. Steven Hillenburg claims he wanted to present Spongebob as a bit of a nerd. I mean, he's a fucking square. Just look at his outfit. And remember when he used to wear those fucking giant glasses? He was into comics and activities that were seen as nerdy in his universe, like jellyfishing, and everything about his design conveyed that. Later, as the series went on, they started leaning more into Spongebob's innocence over his naivety. Naivete? Bordering on making him a baby. And therefore, how they drew him played into that. They made his eyes smaller, his pupils bigger. They almost never had his little cheek thing sticking up anymore, and instead starting to aim it sideways. Minor differences like that go a long way in changing how a character feels, and I think most agreed it was for the worse. Nowadays, I think they've yet again started to drift away from the baby Spongebob we had for many years, and are instead leaning more into a Spongebob that's a bit of a silly goofball. Now, that's not to say that was never a part of his character before, but, but now more than ever they've begun emphasizing it. His eyes are back to being ovals, his little cheek thing has been made way bigger in certain cases. A lot of the time they push his legs together now, and are way more creative when posing him. He's also presented as much more of a short stack. It may feel redundant, but he just looks more square. This fits with the tone they're going for, and on its own, he looks great. But I feel it's clear some of that initial simplistic charm has been lost. I always loved this model sheet drawing of him where he looks like he's bursting out of his pants. He had more of a curve to him initially that was quickly dropped. It's just such an interesting case of how little details go a long way. For example, I could not imagine some of these post-sequel episodes working if he still had that season 1 look. And a lot of season 1 probably wouldn't be as charming if he looked the way he does now. They both perfectly fit the vibe of what the director is going for, which is only pushed further now that the directors and storyboard artists have more freedom to do whatever they want. And even then, with current Spongebob, now that they're cycling through select directors, the Spongebob they present is slightly different to the last. It's weird. I've been stuck in the middle of this argument for so long that I had begun to feel like I needed to provide reasons for why I thought the animation style of the post-sequel era didn't work. I did this for so long that I genuinely started to believe that I thought the new show had bad animation, only to start work on this video and realize that I've never really said that as far as I'm aware. There's without a doubt a case to be made for the charm of those initial few seasons being lost over time. You know, when you make a show that's so wacky and balls off the walls all the time, it makes those moments less and less impactful the more you do it. Spongebob's animation looking so good doesn't have the same effect as it once did back when I saw that tweet when I was 15. What folks were once amazed by is now just... the norm. And I think that, more than anything, highlights why we're now starting to see the discussion of, sure this looks good, but does it fit Spongebob? 
I watched a few episodes from their recent season, even rewatching some from my ranking video, and I can definitely see them making an effort to find the perfect balance between funny visual gags and still containing a well-written story. And in some cases, it works pretty wonderfully, like in Ma and Pa's Last Hurrah or Spatula of the Heavens. They do a much better job than previously mixing a plot with the occasional little montage where they can show off their creativity. I'm all sure there's still the occasional blunder like, dude, I'm so sick of Nosferatu and this dog shit little henchman. I don't get why they take up so much screen time now. But let's be real, the original three seasons had its fair share of shit episodes. And while I can't personally say that I've suddenly become a huge fan or anything and plan on watching every new episode release, I appreciate a lot about New Spongebob, that there is a show these days that is willing to let artists just do what they want. Just because I personally don't get a whole lot out of it doesn't mean nobody else does, because clearly, these new seasons and even stuff like the Patrick Star show resonate with a lot of people. Yo, YouTuber crossovers, my favorite! If any of you know me from even a passing glance, you'll know me as the guy who absolutely adores post-sequel seasons of Spongebob. And not even just for the animation like everyone thinks. Sure, it's absolutely eye candy to look at and one of the best looking cartoons on TV over the past few years, but not every single episode is 100% wacky faces and big gaping mouths all the time. That is a massive overgeneralization. These seasons run on a director system very similar to Golden Age cartoons like Looney Tunes. So, for example, an episode directed by longtime SpongeBob artist Sherm Cohen won't be as wacky as an episode directed by someone like Adam Poloian or Ian Vasquez. My reasons for loving this era run deeper than that, however. A lot of the characters that felt off in the post-movie seasons, mainly Patrick and Mr. Krabs, are really likable again, with Patrick being that really stupid but really supportive happy-go-lucky best friend, and Mr. Krabs actually feeling like he's a father figure to Spongebob again. I really like what they do with a lot of the characters, actually. Bringing back characters like Bubble Bass and Plankton's pet Spot to be new mainstay secondaries, as well as having entire episodes dedicated to really fun character team-ups, like Squidward and Pearl in Whale Watching, or Plankton and the Flying Dutchman in The Ghost of Plankton. My favorite thing about the post-sequel seasons, though, is the creativity and experimentation of it all. Not even just in the animation, but the stories and plots, too. Episodes like Mimic Madness, Feral Friends, Krabby Patty Creature Feature, Karen's Virus, Broken Alarm, SpongeBob in Random Land, Welcome to Binary Bottom, Dopey Dick, and many more are some of the most creative episodes of the entire show and are all among some of my favorite episodes ever. There is a ton more I could say about this era, but I don't want to eat up too much of Ellis Mark's time. I had a pretty big dinner anyway, so I'm not really hungry. By the way, I'm currently in the process of making retrospective videos on every single season on my personal YouTube channel if you want to check that out. Now, if you excuse me, I have to go back to my hometown of Baba Booey World. I guess, at the end of the day, my main source of contention with Spongebob was that it felt as if for a while the show became complacent, too comfortable with the status quo, then no you know the world, then no you know the dynamics, and so why would you stray away from what people are used to? I think that has resulted in some of the weakest episodes of the entire series, such as the season 13 episode Seaman Sponge Heaters Club, where the whole thing consists of characters who don't like Spongebob. Spongebob, recounting the reasons why they don't like Spongebob, like what new are you offering here? I think that's why I at the very least appreciate them finding that balance better. Maybe Spongebob isn't what I remembered it as being whenever I was a kid, but it's been going on for 25 years. What else would you expect? But that doesn't mean the new stuff is bad, it's just not for me. And maybe that's okay.